Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Capricorn Group Annual Financial Results Presentation. A special word of welcome to our shareholders, our studio guests, and our online guests. I am Tina Sprinsler, Group CEO, and joining me on stage today is Baronise Hans, the Managing Director of Bank Vintuk, Zunani Kamperira, the CFO of Bank Vintuk, and Jaku Estreiser, the Financial Director of Capricorn Group. It is indeed a great pleasure for us to welcome you all here today and share a few of the financial results. Um, Capricorn Group is a proudly Namibian financial services group and today's presentation is mainly focused around the financial numbers. However, we are also very pleased to an announce the launch of our integrated report on our website um, and for this year we've managed to review and adjust the report into specific sections uh, targeted for the different uh, stakeholders that would be interested in different components of the report. So as a result, we are publishing the 2021 integrated annual report on our website today with a suite of reports consisting of the integrated annual report with the summarized financial statements, the full set of annual financial statements in a separate document, the risk report, the governance report, and a King 4 index. So please visit our website at uh, www.capricorn.com.na uh, to view and download the, these reports uh, as they might be relevant to you. So today, Yaku will cover the group numbers and the large trends uh, from this financial year, whilst Baronese and Zunani will go into a bit more detail in the Bank Vintuk numbers. Capricorn Group's um, purpose is to be improving lives through leadership in financial services by being connectors of positive change. Our strategic choices are really focused around three main themes. One, to transform our business using data and digital. Two, to grow through entrepreneurial action, to in contribute to a sustainable organization, and three, to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And this is balanced throughout our thinking, throughout our actions, with a large number of key stakeholders beyond just the shareholders. It's looking at the customers, their expectations, general supplies, government, strategic alliance partners, communities, media, employees, and most importantly, regulators that all influence our sphere in our daily lives. We've also really looked at the material matters um, that impact on our strategy, that impact on our actions. And uh, for this next year, what we've also considered, and also in the past, is meeting customer needs and expectations throughout our journey, enhancing and optimizing management and operational systems, continuously driving for better efficiency and effectiveness, financial and cybercrime risk management, credit risk management and mitigating losses due to bad debt, ethical leadership in business in general as well as in management of the business, really focusing on the demand for specialist skills during the focus development and training and diversity, and responding to changing regulatory and operating context, which is happening on a daily basis, and I think we all experience it. So I think with that context, um, I'd like to hand over to Yaku to go into the numbers. Thanks. Thank you, Tinis. Good morning, everyone. So I will start off looking at our financial highlights for the year. Um, the group reported a profit of 983 million, up by 14.8% from last year, an increase of 14.9%. To, uh, on, in earnings per share to 170.7 cents and our dividend increased by 20 cents to 60 cents. So we declared a final dividend of 38 cents. Based on our current share price, that results in a dividend yield of 4.6% and a price earnings ratio of 5.7 times. On the balance sheet, our advances increased by 2.4% and net asset value per share increased by 5%. 
Our return on equity increased by almost 1% to 13.5%, and the group remains very well capitalized at 15% capital ratio. We also played our part in uh, contributing to society during these difficult times that we live in, um, where we contributed just over 12 million for this financial year. If we look at the period since the COVID-19 pandemic started in March of last year, we contributed just over 17 million. We also assisted our clients during this time where we deferred payments on loans to the value of over 5 billion in Namibia and in, in Botswana over 460 million. If we look at the trends over the last three years and take 2019 as our last normal year or so-called normal year and the two years that had COVID impact, all our key indicators of most of our key indicators has turned around in this year and has showed a positive trend. I think also what I would like to highlight is that if you look at the group results compared to 2019, we're only down 3.18%, which compare very favorably with our competitors in the market. Something that I want to focus on is the contribution of, of all our subsidiaries during the year. Um, to get to a 14.8%, it was really a collective effort from all our subsidiaries across the group and the associates that made that possible. And what I want to emphasize on this slide is actually the success over that we achieved over the last three years from our diversification strategy. The contribution of Intrepo who continue to do very well and becoming a significant contributor to our business, um, contributing 12% to our attributable earnings to shareholders. Also, the associates has increased from 6% to 10%, which is mainly as a result of the contribution from Paratas. Capricorn Asset Management has performed very well. They've achieved their highest ever assets under management um, during the first quarter of this year as people moved money to, to, to asset, uh, those kind of asset classes, and they inc also increased their profits by just below 20% this year. Bank Vinduk continued to perform exceptionally well in this market. We're all uh, very proud of, of, of what they've achieved, and uh, Baronese and ZK will, will expand on that later on. And lastly, but definitely not least, is our business in Botswana. And if I have my facts right, I believe it's 15 years since they opened their doors and started operations in Botswana. So for those of our colleagues from Botswana that are tuned in, I want to congratulate them on, on what they've achieved over this time. And it's really a big focus area of, of us. Cyberhunt and team is doing exceptionally well. And to be very proud of what we've achieved in Botswana and contributing now just um, around 6% to the business. Um, I will look at our results in, in four key um, pillars that we break it down in. We look at earnings quality, our liquidity position, credit quality, and capital debt. Starting off with earnings quality, um, we will look at our net interest income. Net interest income increased by 3.3%, which was mainly driven by Bank Vinduk increasing by 1.5%, and then a good contribution from Intrepo, where they increased by 16, or just over 16%. Bank Gabaron, due to the liquidity pressures and the cost of funding pressures, net interest income decreased by just over 5%. If we look at the main contributing factors, especially around Bank Vinduk, the increase is mainly due to good asset growth, where loans and advances increase about 4%. But what's really made a difference is how well um, the bank protected its interest margin. And there we need to take our hats off to our Treasury team, who has done exceptionally well in this year, too, in a low interest rate environment, where we've seen rates cuts of 250 basis points, liquidity pressures, to take your margin back to where it was before the, the crisis or for the pandemic, it's really commendable. And that has made a real difference to our, to our net interest income for the year. On the, on the BG side, um, the bank has done well, but the environment was very difficult. Cost of funding increased across all the classes of, of funding. They had 100 basis point rate cut, but notwithstanding that 100 basis point rate cut, we still saw a 45 basis point increase in our cost of funding, resulting our margin to to come under pressure. But what is good is that the team has managed to, to keep that margin within the range of 3.8% to 4% and to hover within that over the last six months. So I think we have it under control. If we move to non-interest income, and this is all an area where we really outperform our expectations. Non-interest income increased by 3.6%. And it was mainly driven by 
transaction volumes, it played quite a big part to the increase in our transaction fees. Bank Vinduk increased by 10.7% uh, based on a big increase in, in, um, in transaction volumes and also uh, innovative pricing and, and, and tier pricing methodologies applied. In Botswana, we have seen very, very good growth in our non-interest income. We've seen good growth in our transaction volumes and the team has run very well in doing that. I think our, um, the, the transaction in income increased by 46.6%. If you take everything in, into account in Botswana, non-interest income increased by 28.8%. So very good growth and better than what we expected. But it's also well supported by the insurance income where Intrepo play a big part and then also asset management which I earlier mentioned where CAM made a big contribution this year as well. It was negatively impacted by trading income as we've seen a, a, um, less uh, foreign exchange vol volatility during the year and therefore a, a lesser income in that and that offset the, the good growth that we've seen on the other lines. On the expenses side, um, expenses increased by 5.1% this year. Um, to put it in perspective, inflation is now around 4% in Namibia and actually quite high in Botswana where it is now measured at 8.2%. The increase is mainly driven by an increase in employee costs where um, there was additional headcount appointed in our IT environment, um, salary increases to non-managerial, and then on the technology costs and property expenses, those were driven in technology costs mainly by license fees where we entered new licenses on, as a part of our expansion, our, our digital expansion, and secondly, we, we had to renew existing licenses and at the beginning of the year with the euro and, and the dollar rates being significantly higher. Property expenses increased as a result of IFRS 16 and also were contributed by investment in, 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 in IT hardware that the depreciation that flowed out of that increased that line. Then our associates um, also have done very well this year, mainly contributed by, by Paratus Group which contributed about 75% of the growth that we've seen. Also a good contribution from Sunlam um, during the year and Suntum where they were impacted by the business interruption claims um, to, a, to an extent. If you look at our overall contribution, now it's about 10% to the group and that is made up about 35% of Paratus, 40% Sunlam and 25% Suntum. If we move on to liquidity, it's something that is very key and big focus for us in the group um, that we always uh, keep a very close eye on. We believe we have very healthy liquidity levels both in our bank and at the group level. Bank Gaberone has more than doubled the minimum, um, the minimum liquid asset requirement and Bank Winduk has 83% more than the minimum requirement sitting at um, around 3 billion in excess. That's over and above the one billion that we have at the group level to support our two banks. So we really think that at the, at the, at the group, at the, as overall, as a group, we are well uh, positioned in terms of liquidity. Our, our funding side, um, funding grew by 1.9%. Um, if you look at the two banks, Bank Vinduk increased by 2.8% and Bank Gabroni by 11%. ZK and, and, and Baronese will expand on, on the funding growth in, in Bank Vinduk later on. The Bank Gabaroni funding growth is really commendable in this year. Remember, as I said earlier, it was an environment of low liquidity in Botswana and to grow it by that much, to bring the LFR down is commendable. They also managed to grow that funding in the more cheaper sources of funding. Your savings, current and demand deposits increased by just below 20% which is really, really commendable and I think it was a key focus for them and they've done well on that. As I mentioned earlier around the margin, we've managed to, to manage our cost of funding down and recoup a lot of the, a big part of the majority of the part of the, the rate cuts that we've, that we've seen um, at the end of last financial year. We move to credit quality in the, the very topical matter at the moment, everyone talking about the bank's assets and, and the quality of it. Um, so loans and advances in Bank Vinduk increased by 4%, well above the private sector credit extension of 27 and in Botswana it increased by 4.8%. And this is important for me to emphasize this. There's a lot of um, set around financing in, in, in this difficult times and I think it's really commendable the, the way our banks 
supported the customers during these difficult times and extending finance to, financing to customers and delivering growth in advances during these difficult times. Um, the growth is mainly at the top three lines where we've seen overdraft term loans and mortgages um, uh, contributing mainly to that, to that growth. On non-performing loans, I will come to the next slide. And I just want to spend a bit of time at the bottom part with our impairment provisions. Um, this year, there was a discussion again last year where around interest on stage three loans, and we've changed our, our approach to that. We recognize interest on stage three loans, so those loans that are a non-performing status in this year. Um, that impacts, well, when you recognize that, you gross up your impairment and you gross up interest income. So both those lines increase. So you will see that stage three bottom line where we increase by 18.9%. If we take the interest, suspend, interest in, on stage three loans that we've included in that line out, that only increased by 15.6%. So I think that's just, in, and I will come back to it later when we talk about impairment charges also. So when we look at our non-performing loans, and this I've inc excluded uh, interest on stage three loans. So this is just the real non-performing loans, not that interest uh, on, the, on the loans included. So Bank Vinduk had, a, had an increase in September last year, uh, which we reported before uh, of the two well-characterized clients that moved into non-performing status. That resulted in, in that um, uh, ratio to increase. And thereafter, it remained fairly static throughout the year. Bank Gaberoni has managed to, to decrease their um, non-performing loans uh, with, with ended up at 5.6% as a result of write-offs where they made good recoveries. On the impayment charges side, so what's going to the income statement, our impayment charges increased by 8.9%. By Again, as I said, the interest on stage 3 loans are in that number. If we take that interest, interest on stage 3 loans out, that number decreased by 2.6%. But we also need to take into account and that what's very important to note is that we didn't release any of the economic overlays that we created last year as part of the, the when the pandemic was um, at the end of, last, of, of, of June last year. Over and above that, and I will talk to that on the next slide, we also created additional provisions because remember our year at the end of June, COVID, the third wave was at its highest in the middle. There was a lot of uncertainty and we really thought to apply prudency to our provisions because we didn't know how that's going to span out. So there's over and above the economic overlays of last year, we also created additional provisions in, in, our, um, in our impairment charges number. On the loan deferments, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, of the five point. Uh, 1 billion in Namibia, only 158 million is still outstanding, and in Botswana, 270 million. Both of those are well collateralized, and we are not um, concerned around them. Um, if we look at our, what we call stage two exposures, stage two are the clients that has missed one payment, but is not yet in non-performing status, so in that missed one payment, but not more than three. But what we also include in stage two are clients that are still performing, fully up to date with their payments, but where the, the group and the bank deemed that there was an increase in credit risk. So, and then those clients, we, we closely monitor them, and there's only when, in, in those cases, only as a result of external factors. And then we move those clients into stage two. And you will see that blue line, the bank Vinduk line at the end, is as an as a increase from May to June. That's mainly as a result of clients that was performing that we moved into, into stage two one, that what we call um, just to for closer monitoring. And as a result of that, we created the additional impayment charges for those uh, provisions to, to, to be more on the, on the prudent side. Um, if we look at our capital, um, something that I think we're always proud of is our capital. We have very good capital levels, both at the bank, uh, both our bank levels as well as the group level, and well above the minimum capital requirements. And then lastly, I will, um, just on the two main transactions during the year, um, you all know we've well reported on our, our sale of Cavmon Bank, which we're all very glad about, and that, um, and that we concluded on the, the 4th of of January, we had to recognize the losses from, for, for the first six months of 41 million still in this financial year. And then lastly, um, also you will know that 
we invested in Nimbus, um, which is now Paratus Nimbus Holdings, a number of years ago when they listed. We really believed in the Paratus story. We believed in their strategy. And we made that one of the key investors in Nimbus when they listed on the, on the stock exchange. That was always the intention and back then when we, when we invested in Nimbus that we want to invest in the Paratus group to have the exposure of the, of the, uh, the, the wider group and align with our own ambitions in, in expanding beyond Namibia. Um, when we made that investment, we made it clear that we also only want to have one point of entry. We don't want to have two investments into the Paratus group. So the opportunity arises to, to, to sell our investment in Paratus Namibia Holdings in, in June, just before year end. But we've kept, and it's important that you know, the investment in our Paratus group as we always wanted to, because that we still believe in that and we still believe in that growth strategy. And, and, and as you can see, they're making a significant contribution to the group. So that's it from my side. I will hand over to, to, to Baronese and ZK to take us through Bank Vinduk. Uh, thank you very much, Jaco. Good morning, everyone. So we'll be speaking specifically to Bank Vintuk and we'll be focusing on the following topics. The first topic we'll reflect on is just the macroeconomic environment and operating context. We'll be talking to our business impact. In particular, we'll be focusing on financial performance. We'll focus and talk a little bit about our environmental and social stewardship, distinction in how we do business, and lastly, the year ahead. So on that note, I'll hand over to ZK. Thanks, Baronisa. I thought you, today you'll say then on there, but uh, it's fine. Uh, good morning to everyone. So I think what I'll try to do, I think Yaku has covered part of the stuff, but what I'll try to do is that uh, look at macro, and we can't talk macro without talking about COVID. So I, I think the year has been COVID. So what we've tried to do now, in the slide you'll see, we've done the stringency index, which really measures how how what were the interventions? And obviously in our case, I think interventions, all of us know, was mainly lockdown. And what we saw with lockdown is that um, volumes went down completely, or not completely, but were off the mark completely. And then what we then saw is that also with the first lockdown, customer behavior was almost measured. So people didn't transact as much as they would have. And then when we late, what we saw later on in the year, in the first quarter, around March, February, we saw volumes returning to pre-pandemic levels. But then when we see that, what we saw then towards the end of the year is that uh, uh, with the third wave, obviously then lockdown came again. So this then obviously in the next slide I'll cover now what does that mean for, for GDP and so on for us. And then the other side of it is that um, we saw is that uh, with, and, and I think the thing maybe a bit more forward looking what we worry about is that is vaccination. Because vaccination will build that almost ability for us to sort of remain in normal and therefore transact. And what we've seen is also that um, there's been very little um, tourism activity or forex flows. So that um, our levels of vaccination warriors, I think that if we could get them higher, so that should maybe a third or fourth wave come, sort of economic activity can sort of remain. If I can then get into the next slide now. So we saw GDP at minus 7.9. But noting that the last four years before that, times were tough. So you're already coming out of a tough time, and then obviously almost like COVID feels like it fell and kicked it down. So although we recovered, I think that volume of recovery is still, we're still far from where we were a few years back. So it, it really is a tough macro environment in which we find ourselves. Um, if you look at private sector credit extension in Namibia, um, we come from a high of 8.6 in 2016 to 2.7 um, in 2021 for us. And yes, I will cover that when we look at our balance sheet, but it shows that there was very li limited demand for credit. And then the other one, obviously, I mean, this I must, uh, can create also our treasury team. We'll talk about it when we talk margins, but what we, we try to look at is that we had 250 basis point rate cut, right? But when we look at comparative years, it's an actual um, loss of about 220 average uh, on, uh, basis points year on year. And then I think I will hand over to Baroness for the next slide. Thank you very much. So I'll just start with the themes that informed our year. And really, Yaku's touched on it quite a lot. One of the key themes that came through and really informs what we call more sustainable or sustained recovery is steady top-line growth. 
We believe that driving the top line is ultimately the key measure for growth. We've done this, as was mentioned earlier, through optimizing our funding mix, as well as growing advances. So even in difficult times, it is important to seek opportunity and to capitalize on those opportunities. We've also seen, as was mentioned by Denaune, that transaction volumes uh, returned to pre-COVID levels, which, was very, which is very uh, heartening, and we believe that these are the right indicators for, for the right levels of recovery to come. But as Yaku has mentioned earlier, we remain very prudent and conservative in terms of our outlook, and especially around credit provisions. We've also really tried to control costs, but at the same time, balance that with investing into the future and making sure we do not sacrifice the future for the present. In terms of customers, it was really, it was quite encouraging to see customer activity return, and we've seen good growth in our customer numbers, as well as an increase in our contribution per customer. As far as our customer solutions were concerned, this year we, were, we launched our new mobile app. We were quite excited about that. We've also launched our new business wallet, our business eye lounge, and our new SME COVID loan. We've also introduced more self-service banking devices and options, and we've made good progress and substantial investment into our digital omni-channel banking model. Customer support, as Yaku mentioned, was key and top of mind. We assisted quite a few clients in terms of deferments as well as moratoria in both interest and capital. But we also managed that process to get customers back to regular payments very well. And as a result, those deferments have come down substantially. Our business is more than just about profit. And if you look at our social investment, we've doubled, more than doubled our spend, and we'll talk to that a bit later. And lastly, we were very proud of pioneering a new first in green financing through our sustainability bond. So if I can just take it back one slide, this is all played out in our bank at a glance. If you look at our market share, it's evident in terms of retaining our number one position in loans and advances. We've seen the right drivers in profitability move in the right direction. And then our balance sheet remains strong and was reinforced by the performance of the last financial year. At this stage, once again, um, just to focus on those key drivers, and sometimes one looks at the lag indicators, which are your financials, but the lead indicators that came through for us was steady growth in our customer numbers and making sure we do more things with our customers. So more activity with customers, which then translates into a higher contribution. We've also been helped by COVID in some respects in terms of just the adoption of e-channels. For the year 2020 to 2021, we've seen a steep uptake in, in terms of e-channels. As you can see in prior years, we were around 35% in terms of usage and adoption of e-channels, but that has skyrocketed to around 48% as customers have become more comfortable with our electronic channels. In terms of market share, as was mentioned as well, we've seen good growth not only, on, not only in advances, but also on our, our liability front. As far as diversified revenue streams are concerned, that was a focus as well, and we've seen that play out, especially in the last year, as our fee income to total income has improved. So ZK will just take us, or then our name, let me just go back to his real name, <laughs> will take us back to the balance sheet and just focus a little bit more in depth on Bang Wintuk. Yeah, so I think uh, Baroness and Yaku have spoken to it to some extent. So Bang Wintuk cross loans and, and advances is up 4%, which is way ahead of private sector credit extension. And uh, you know, I, I, this is a story I've had to come learn when I got here is that uh, I think the depth of knowledge of the management team really showed that despite the tough times, we're able to find pockets of opportunity. And, and where therefore we're able to grow and be able to, at this point, also support clients. So although times were tough, uh, I, mean, I think that we continue to do what we believe is right. And then on the funding side, then to congratulate the Treasury team yet again, is yes, we continue to grow advances and um, um, funding, um, market share, but we didn't sacrifice a risk. So we continue, we sort of maintain our structure. We didn't, so short, medium, long term, sort of remain the same. And yet we're able to price it down and therefore almost what is the English word? Um, soften the blow of the endowment impact. So although we have lost 220 basis points on average in repo, our margin was only, we only went, lost about 21 basis points, which is really a good story to tell. If I can then touch on asset quality from a bank venture perspective, and I think uh, we spoke to this. I think you could say we look at credit 
because of the depth of knowledge, probably more at, at a client level, really, than necessarily portfolio, although portfolio remains important. So NPLs are up 5.89%, and now then the question becomes, is it an uh, uh, increase, is it a deterioration in, us, in the quality of the book, or is it, is it specific clients? I think in our case, it tends to be more specific clients that you can really pinpoint to what, why the increase in NPL. Then the other side, when we look at the credit loss ratio, and Yaku alluded to this as well, is to say, well, are we adequately provided? I think before we even get to profit, we start by saying, but are we adequately provided? Are we protecting the business for that eventual future? And are we doing what is, what is sustainable? And that prudent approach comes through those credit loss ratios, as Yaku alluded to, where in some instances, although clients didn't necessarily start defaulting, when we look at the macro context in which they operate, the sector, and so on, and we said, well, maybe we need to provide more for those clients than not. And then on that note, I think then I can, then I can get on to um, key growth factors in the income statement. Most. So when we look at revenue, I think the net interest income story we've spoken comprehensively about. Non-interest revenue, I've sort of alluded to when I spoke to the COVID slide. So we, we grew non-interest revenue, 4.3% that you see there, off the back of, I think it's more a customer growth number than necessarily anything else. And yes, we, we try to price uh, both for value and competitively and, and, and be able to achieve that. I think given what we've seen in terms of customer behavior, I think really it is a good story. It is a really good story. Impairment, I think we spoke about already, which is um, prudent provisioning. And then on cost, we, and Baruni spoke to this, is that um, in, we had to spend slightly more than inflation. We must future fit the business. We, we, we must also continue to remain efficient. And when we look at our cost to income ratio, you'll see that although there was a, uh, although top line didn't grow as fast as it could have, our cost to income ratio only slightly moved up. So it shows that we remain efficient as a business. I think we remain a solid, efficient business. And then the last part, which is sort of more my favorite part for me is around capital. So, and I'll touch on ROE. So at ROE of 12.9%, one could say that uh, our capital accretion is not as, as what we'd want it to be. Because obviously we start with a high capital base and then we must generate a lot of return for ROE to continue to get better. But then we say the other side of it is, it is around, you know, risk return and growth must always be in balance. So the other side of it is that we must build a resilient balance sheet to be able to, you know, to future fit the business for that eventual future, which you see then in our capital numbers where we remain 4.5% ahead of re regulatory minimum. And when you look at capital, we may be down 1%, but that's more a function of regulation than necessarily uh, uh, us having lost capital to, to be able to say so. So I think that we, 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 yes, it's something we must work on, and I think it's something we can do better on going forward, but I think that we have really ensured that our balance sheet is resilient and we'll be able probably to emerge from this pandemic or new realities one, depending on how you look at it, stronger. And on that note, I think I can end over to Baroness. Thank you, Denone. In terms of who we are, it's very important for us to focus on our environmental and social stewardship. And on that front, as I've mentioned earlier, we launched our green bond in 2019. And in the last financial year, we built on that success by launching the first sustainability bond in Namibia and also becoming a member of the NASDAQ Sustainable Bond Network. We also believe in doing good and making sure that we respond to the need around us. And especially in these COVID times, we've seen that need increase and that has caused us to more than double our commitment to social investment. And we focus in particular on the areas of healthcare, entrepreneurship and job creation, education and training, poverty alleviation, and lastly, COVID-19 support. If we look at COVID-19, we, we focused on various elements in a bit more detail, but most important, as was mentioned, was customer support, making sure our, so our staff, our employees are safe and well looked after, 
as I've said earlier, the communities, we operate, the community makes us who we are and we operate in a community that, su that supports us. Therefore, we believe that we need to give back and we've done so and facilitated various payments and grants as well as support to, to our communities. And lastly, as, as ZK has said, amidst all of this, we must have a balance sheet that is resilient. The most, one of the most, what's the most uh, important attributes of a business is really to be adaptable. And we were able to adapt our business in these times, as well as make sure that we protect our customers and our employees. So if we look at the year that has been, we can't but not recognize uh, the fact that we received various accolades, both internationally and locally. And some of these accolades include the best bank in Namibia for the second consecutive year, and this award received from PSG Namibia, as well as the best green financial uh, institution, which was a sustainable uh, development award that we received. And this, the point we'd like to make on this slide is that all of this is possible because of the great men and women that work for our bank and that make it possible for us to succeed and become a truly homegrown and proudly Namibian institution. In terms of our last slide, which talks to the year ahead, as ZK has said, the outlook remains very difficult. We do expect the lag and lingering effects of the pandemic to continue and to exert pressure on businesses. Our response is, as we said earlier, to make sure we deliver a customer-centric business by design, that we continue to support our customers on their individual journeys, and we really are a bank that believes in relationships, so it's important that we focus on our customers and continue to build on our relationships. In terms of digital, we have to have a bank and a business that's future fit, and we will continue to drive our digital strategy. We also, as ZK has mentioned, believe in capturing opportunities and being entrepreneurial, even when times are difficult, and we've seen that in the last year, We'll continue to do that going forward. And lastly, we must remain relevant in the environment and in the communities that we operate. And we'll continue to be and to, to be and to play an important role in Namibia in that regard. Thank you very much. That concludes our presentation. We'll probably take questions now. Yeah, thanks, Bernice. Um, we've got a few questions that came in online, uh, which I'll read and then ask one of the panelists to come in on it. Um, and if our studio audience has got any questions, please indicate such that we can also give you an opportunity to come in. Um, ironically, I think, Baronis, the first questions you've just answered yes. to, to a large degree, but I think there's perhaps an aspect that Yaku can come in on. Um, in these COVID-19 times, how is the group going to deal with the new normal with regards to delivering on the numbers and the growth in the future? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Tinas. Um, I think with the, the growth at the moment, um, you know, as, as we invested over the last number of years in, in diversifying our business and um, to become less dependent on, on one business was important. And I think we've seen that in, in, in this year. And as I mentioned, in times like this, sectors get differently affected um, when you go through crises like what we're currently experiencing. So I think in the year ahead, um, Tina's obviously the group, there's a lot of focus for us in Botswana, uh, where we want to really grow our market share. We've got a, uh, a young bank um, with a lot of potential and a lot of groundwork done. And I believe our growth can be, can be very much supported from our business in Botswana. And then in, in Namibia, um, Bank Vinduk, uh, I believe, will continue to grow they, like they've done in this year. Um, and they will play their part in the Namibian economy. And then also from our, all our businesses, because we've become now well diversified, you know, the Intrepo, the asset management apparatus businesses, I think everyone will again contribute to it. I think we need to be, there's uncertainty around um, COVID and the impact that COVID um, had post year end and, and, and on, you know, the insurance industry. And, and also given that there's expectation around the fourth wave um, in South Africa towards the end of the year in our, in, in our environment, maybe beginning of next year, which brings uncertainty. But I think growth for us will come from focusing on, you know, new products, new sectors, our IT investment, um, and, and that's what's going to drive, not so much for us at the moment, expanding beyond the borders of, of the countries where we're operating. We want to grow in, in, in Namibia and Botswana. 
And that's where our focus is, and that's where we're gonna, gonna spend our time. Thanks, Jaku. Um, Bernice, maybe a question to you. Uh, how has the group dealt with the change in customer behavior, specifically as indicated in the Bank Vintage presentation? And are there any strategies that the bank will apply to ensure that customers are retained and serviced? Yes, thanks, Tina. That's definitely our approach in terms of our current strategy is to adapt our business to make sure that we are a business built around our customer and that we exist to serve customer needs. So we've done so. And in fact, in many ways, the pandemic is assisting us to just reshape how we think about digital adoption. We think that the future of banking will be digital, but we also want to protect that personal interaction. So everything in our strategy is really taking this into account and we're positioning ourselves to embrace customer migration. In fact, we're very happy with the behavior that we're seeing right now because I think it, it talks to a, lot, a much better banking experience and a much more efficient banking experience for our customers. Um, and really, we'll continue to explore and, and innovate around customer need. Thanks, Bernice. Uh, Zanani, perhaps one for you. Um, you touched on the COVID uh, side and the vaccinations. Do we anticipate conquering the COVID effects in the short to medium term? Sure, Tines, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Let me, I will try to, in the, I'll quote Nicholas Dalap and say that I don't think any, was, any one of us knows what the future will look like. I think that's the starting point, but we can plan for it. So as to whether we will conquer or not, I think for me, it just boils down to vaccination. If we can get that right, and then I think then it, there's some normality that will return to a point. But given the numbers that we see now, given the reports we see where is it Lady Pamba closing their vaccination um, area the other day, mm. I, I worry. Mm. I think that's... that's Thanks, Zinon. Mm. I think it's a valid point and uh, quite critical to consider. So I'm not just having a quick scan here if there's any questions in the audience. Okay, there's one. need to stand in front of the TV. <laughs> Usually analysts don't like standing in front of TVs. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'll just start off with congratulating the team for a good set of results given the macroeconomic backdrop. Um, well done. I have two questions. One, I would like to ask about, we've, we've talked to the growth possibilities, but also maybe you guys can talk a bit more in terms of fintech and what is globally happening and where do you see the bank specifically going in the next couple of years? And then secondly, I would like to ask um, Berenice perhaps on, in terms of the clients supporting the clients, holding their hand, um, a good initiative. And I would like to just ask about moratoriums. Is it a big part? Are you, how strongly um, does that factor if you, if you roll in the numbers, if that makes sense? Thank you. Yes. Uh, shall I start with the last question first? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much. And um, from where we stand, in terms of the moratoriums, yeah, you may be aware of a regulation called BIT 33, which has which is almost um, allowed the industry to assist customer customers. This was a, a regulation passed by the central bank last year to assist clients, which allowed us to go up to, I think, 24 months in terms of both capital and, inter and interest um, moratoria. What we've seen in the beginning of the process was we actually, in total, in total deferments, uh, we were at, at our peak around six billion in, to, in terms of total loans deferred, but we were able to, by, by working with our clients, bring that down substantially to, I think, very low levels right now. I think our last figure is about 180 million of capital deferments. So we've seen, so what we've seen is yes, there was demand, but as business activity returned and as clients adapted, that number are reduced substantially and in fact it's a negligible component um, in our results right now. In terms of fintech and innovation we also have our CIO here uh, so we'll draw on his uh, on his brain if we need to but in terms of uh, specifically our banking entities our focus is very much on building a digital omni-channel banking model that is future fit that allows clients to engage with us seamlessly 24 7 but it also allows that personal interaction because we are we, our the core to our business is relationships so we do want to continue having a space and an environment where customers can experience experience us physically in a very efficient manner but that all our digital options 
are also available and, the, and, the, and an exciting experience for our clients. So that's where we're going. We're looking at fintech partners where it makes sense to do so. We do have partners that we work on in terms of our build of these future solutions. Um, but it's a, it's a core part of, what we, of where we see banking going. And we started this journey about a year ago when we spoke to balancing cost versus investment. That is absolutely around digital investments uh, into the future. Yeah, thanks, Baronis. And um, I think it's also very much enshrined into that first uh, strategic choice, which I don't go into detail, but there's a lot to share in the integrated report also on that, yeah. in terms of unpacking it. I don't see any other hands. Sorry, there's another hand in the back there. Morning, all. Uh, I know we're talking results, but as has been alluded to, vaccines will impact on results. I wanted to just quickly go back to vaccines. Uh, in terms of uptake, is the Capricorn Group and Bank Fintook, uh, do you have any specific projects to encourage vaccine uptake? And then possibly on a slightly more controversial note, is there any plan to implement some form of vaccine mandate? I think yeah, Tina's going to take that, that question. question. Um, I think through our wellness program, we continuously encourage staff to take part in the uh, vaccine program that's rolled out by the government. We uh, also participated in the uh, industry-wide program that, that's running through the year. Um, and then we're looking towards the government also to provide that guidelines. I think uh, one company won't make a difference on its own. I think it is a collective effort and um, we've also got to respect personal choice within it. So we, we provide opportunity, we provide information, and um, hopefully that will play through in the long run. So, yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I think on that note, um, thanks for the panelists, for your uh, very clear articulation and sharing of information. Um, I know there's probably quite a number of media queries still, but thanks for the participation today, thanks for your time, um, and we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you very much.